So this man is going to be trying to convince us that crystals have magic powers. Let's watch. Can a Tesla want to use this to power 200 lamps from 25 miles away? Let's keep... Citation needed. Give you an introduction to crystals. We're specifically talking about this one today. So that's a quartz crystal. Fine. Very, very common crystal. Crystals don't have powers. Oh, really? Go check your watch and I guarantee you it says quartz on the back of it. So, you won't be able to see this, but I took my watch off. This is a Casio, it's a G-Shock. It almost certainly does actually run from a quartz oscillator. However, it doesn't actually say quartz on the back of it. I checked. And the reason why is absolutely baffling. Now, it's in my hand as a solid, but it's neither solid nor liquid. That is a solid. You cannot hold things that are not solid in your hand. At least with very few exceptions. Pitch would be a good example, but quartz is a crystalline solid. It vibrates at 786,000 pulses per millisecond. That's So that's a claim. Let's go see if we can find the source. Quartz, 786,000 pulses per millisecond. So the ornate oracle, what is this? Clear quartz is neither a solid or a liquid. It vibrates at 786,000 pulses per millisecond. This must be where he got this claim from. Unfortunately, it's not true. And one of the ways that we know it's not true is because we can check the rate at which quartz oscillates even in electronic devices. So let's go to a common electronic retailer, Mauser. Let's go look at the frequency control and timing devices. This is a place to get electronic components one of which is a quartz oscillator. Let's just type in quartz and just see what the frequencies are available. So <clears throat> what do we have here? So it looks like they go up to 669 megahertz, which is not 786 megahertz or 786,000 pulses per millisecond. Um, so this claim seems false. Quartz doesn't have a natural resonant frequency anyway. It depends on the shape and the size of the cut of the quartz. So I'm not sure where this website found its claim, but it says it. Also, uh, quartz doesn't originate from Madagascar. Quartz is found everywhere on the planet. Anyway, let's keep watching the video. What gives it the structure? So the oscillations don't give quartz the structure. In fact, the oscillations of the quartz when you apply electric fields to it, um, is caused by the structure. Whenever you have a resonating thing, almost always, especially when it's mechanical resonance, like in the quartz crystal, it is the shape and the size of the thing that's doing the resonating that determines the frequency. And in particular, the shape and the size depends on the structure. So it's really the structure that determines the oscillations, not the other way around. The root of the word crystal can be found in ancient Greece. In the 3rd century BCE, philosopher Theophrastus gave it the name crystallus, hinting at the word solid ice. Okay, I mean it's a cool etymology lesson. I'm not going to fact check on that. It's, it might not be true, but it doesn't matter. Theophrastus thought that quartz was a super cooled version of ice. I don't know why he would think that. If it was super cooled, wouldn't it be colder than ice? What's fascinating is this one's a little bit broken, but in the 17th century, Danish philosopher Nicholas Steno figured out that regardless of quartz's size or shape, the long prism parts of the quartz joined up at a 60 degree angle all the time. Yeah. So as a result of the crystalline structure of quartz, it takes on this nice, beautiful crystal shape, which you just showed. Um, a lot of crystals do this. You'll find that crystals of salt, sodium chloride, they form cubes. So they have 90 degree, 90 degree angles between their faces. Quartz, I'm just going to trust that it is 60 degrees. It looks about right. Uh, well, it's at least 60 degrees exterior angle, maybe 120 degrees interior, hard to say. Due to its unique tetrahedral structure, which is one silicon and four oxygen atoms. Right, so in fact, actually, quartz would be better described as silicon dioxide, even though it is true that the two oxygen atoms in each silicon dioxide group are shared between other silicon atoms. So you end up with each silicon atom having four oxygens. However, the chemical composition for quartz is silicon dioxide. But how does that help it being powerful? Good question. The oxygen atoms are shared between each shape. So instead of it being four oxygen and one silicon, 
It's actually SiO2, and then the last two oxygens are shared in the next part of the structure. That oh, it's just what I said. Great. That's what gives it the shape. Now, because it's made of silicon, it can hold energy. Silicon doesn't hold energy. Silicon's just an element on the periodic table. It's no different than any other element. However, what you can do with silicon in its pure form is make semiconductors, which is super useful, especially because these semiconductors are precisely what's needed to make transistors. And transistors are the heart of electronics. However, silicon dioxide, not a semiconductor. It's just a crystal. In fact, it's a remarkably common crystal. Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Nvidia, all of these people are a fucking war over shit like silicon. They go in MacBooks, phones, everything. Yeah, so there's silicon coming up in two different ways, or probably many more than two, but at least two different ways in these electronics. First, basically every single transistor is going to have some amount of silicon in it. it might also be gallium arsenide, but um, most of them are going to be silicon. And the reason for this is because silicon conducts in a very particular way, depending on the temperature, depending on how you apply a voltage to it, it will conduct electricity or it won't, which makes it very good for making transistors, which are sort of like electronic switches. The other way that silicon will show up is in the form of silicon dioxide quartz in the timing mechanisms of these devices. In order to make, say, a computer, a computer needs a clock to keep it running on time to keep everything synchronized, and perhaps, and quite often, the clocks that are used in these computers are quartz clocks. This is actually natural silicon made with oxygen. It has ridiculous properties. You put. Pr well, it's just silicon dioxide. Super abundant. Pressure onto this, even though it's solid as hell, it actually generates positive and negative on both sides. The more realistic the crystal is to it being its natural shape, so it's essentially a six sided prism with a pyramid at each end. If you can get one of those, it's a fucking battery. Okay, so the first part was right. He's talking about the piezoelectric effect. And in particular, there's this lovely, lovely uh, diagram here of what the piezoelectric effect really is. So you have a silicon dioxide uh, crystal. This is a, kind of like a, a small chunk of silicon dioxide. Um, and when you apply tension to it, the relative charges on the oxygen and silicon atoms changes their distribution. And you end up with net positive on one side of the crystal up here and then net negative on the other side of the crystal down here. Similarly, when you compress it, it again redistributes the charges, so you end up with negative on one side and positive on the other side. What this means is that you can use it as, say, a pressure sensor. Alternatively, when you apply voltages to it, it'll change shape. And so the way that these crystal oscillators are made is that you apply a voltage to it, it expands, you turn off the voltage, it contracts, which gives off a voltage. And so the rate at which it expands and contracts will have some sort of resonant frequency. And if you time your input voltages just right, then it'll amplify and produce resonance, which means that you can then use that signal to, say, time a computer. The pressure on it over time, it generates electricity and you can use it to power things. That's why they power watches. So the one thing about piezoelectricity that everybody should know is that it is not used for power generation. It is not used to store energy. When you compress, the piezoelectric material, in this case quartz. It definitely will have a buildup of charge, and you can use that charge to generate a short pulse of electricity. You can't just apply a constant pressure and expect to get energy out of it forever. There's no free energy. They don't store energy. They're not sources of energy. What they are is they can transfer, or transform, I suppose, mechanical energy into electrical energy in a very inefficient way, perhaps. But it can be done. It can be useful for sensors and for timing and things like that. But they don't power watches. Watches are powered by batteries. In fact, the type of batteries that watches are powered by are called watch batteries. If you have ever handled a watch, you would know that sometimes you have to take the little round watch battery out, which is just a normal chemical battery, swap it out with a new one. It's a thing that you have to do. It's not powered by quartz. Because the battery is compressed inside the watch, that's what causes the watch to function. This that's not true. This feature is called piezoelectricity. The reason why it's so good at timekeeping is because of the vibrations that it holds when it oscillates back and forwards between the poles. It's consistent and unwavering. That's roughly true. It doesn't have oscillations within it, but it has a resonant frequency, again, depending on the size and shape of the crystal. 
and it is very, very consistent. It hardly varies with temperature, with external pressure, things like this. And because it vibrates at 786,000 pulses per millisecond. It doesn't. It cannot go wrong. Quartz is used in tons of stuff. GPS, mobile phones, and computers. Yeah, as the property of piezoelectricity was discovered by a dude named Pierre Curie and his brother, Jacques. Funnily enough, these are the same Curies that Marie Curie married, one of them, uh, I think Pierre. It's fucking wild to note that by the 1930s, the majority of electrical things were powered by quartz. Nothing has ever been powered by quartz. I'm not sure where he got that claim. Quartz may have been in things, especially for early radios and the like, to get timings, but it's never been powered by quartz. But outside of that, Nikola Tesla actually thought that quartz crystals were living entities. Nikola Tesla also thought that you could marry birds. Because they had the ability to store memory. I don't know if you've seen that experiment where they get a quartz crystal, they put it in a jar of water, and then they put the jar of water in the freezer, and then it freezes, but it freezes in the same tetrahedral structure that the crystal is formed in. So essentially, if a crystal can provide that memory to water, likewise, we are providing memory to crystal. It has to work, the law of cause and effect, as above, so below. So I don't know what experiment he's talking about here. I did some searching before I recorded this video. I couldn't find anything on it. If somebody can find something on it, let me know in the comments. But yeah, it sounds like nonsense. But but more than that, let's say it's true. Let's say that because the crystal is in the water, when it freezes, it takes on that form because the crystal already has that form. And so perhaps the nucleation happens. What does that have to do with memory? Why does that mean that the quartz crystal somehow stores memory? And furthermore, how could we affect that? What? This, this whole as above, so below, cause and effect, it's just word salad words used to invoke a vibe that things should behave in a particular way with no reason. This is so powerful and I don't think we've begun to understand what it's capable of. It's been in my hand for this long now. It's absolutely roasting, so I'm gonna put it down. If you have any questions. Okay, video's over. Quartz is really useful. Like, it, it is a really useful crystal, but it's not powerful. It's not like magic. It doesn't have powers. We know a lot about it. It's a very simple mineral. Like I said, it's something like 12% of the Earth's crust, so it's the most abundant mineral on the surface of the Earth. So there's really not much more to learn about it as far as groundbreaking things. Now, I'm sure chemists and engineers, physicists, will find new cool things that it does. That's how science tends to happen. But they're not going to find that... You know, it's going to fix your chakras or anything. Sorry.